All right. Cheers, Pierre. Um, buongiorno, everyone. Um, how good was yesterday? What a great day of talks. I really enjoyed myself. Um, and it's great to be here so early. I um, hope it's not too early for everyone. Um, I'm John. Um, in May, I quit my job to go freelance. Freelancing's awesome. As is common when speaking to humans in the real world, I do that sometimes when I'm not on Twitter, um, they'll say, John, what do you do? And I'll say something like, I started as a designer, but now I do a mix of design and front end and back end and product strategy. Um, and I spend a lot of time on Twitter, as we've already ascertained. That's a bit of a mouthful. If they don't work in tech, they'll say, um, well, they'll smile politely, and then they'll go speak to someone else. If they do work in tech, they might say something like, oh, so you're a unicorn. A unicorn, really? Um, I don't like the word unicorn. It's a weird, it's a weird word. Um, I think we need to talk about this word unicorn um, and why people feel the need to use it. I try to be open and positive, especially early in the morning, straight after breakfast, before the second coffee, and especially when the first 10 rows of the venue are really, really hung over. But I want to take a second to dwell on how much I hate the word unicorn and how I think it's holding back the work we do. Unicorn to me is kind of exclusionary. It's an attempt to mock people with multidisciplinary skills by making them seem weird and unattainable and kind of mythical and rainbow colored. Um, it makes people who you know, feign knowledge of two or more things to be like charlatans. I think it's weird. Um, so I started looking at why people call um, designers who code or developers who design or people like Owen who write and design and do everything, why people call people unicorns. And I got some quotes. Um, one of my friends, Sasha, loved the guy, but um, he came up with this quote that kind of puzzled me. He said, if you're looking for a designer who can come up with your identity, design your site, create UIs with great user experience for your web and mobile apps, and on top of that, code their work in HTML, CSS, a bit of JavaScript, then you're hunting unicorns. This confused me because Sasha is one of the best designers I know, um, but he studied computer science. He's a super smart guy. He wrote an amazing book about Meteor.js. That's pretty heavy. Um, and he's a prolific contributor to open source. So for him to say that designers shouldn't be able to code or you shouldn't be able to find designers who can code, that's a bit weird. Some more quotes. Um, Design engineer, that's another great word that people should never use. Um, a mythical person startups are looking for who can do UX, UI, um, and also have excellent front-end and back-end coding skills. It's Chris Dixon, um, big VC. You'd think, he'd want, um, you'd think he'd want to find people like that. Um, he can't seem to find them, which is weird because I know loads of people who can do all of those things. Anyway. Um, another guy, this is, bit, this is a bit of a longer story. Um, I was speaking to an entrepreneur the other day when he mentioned he was looking for a creative director with UX skills. Having recently completed a year-long search for just such a person, I believe that this person was, in fact, a unicorn. Um, that's a weird, that's weird. Like, maybe not front-end and back-end and sysadmin, but like most designers I know can kind of do dis um, UX and UX and visual design. I don't think that makes you a unicorn. Um, but looking at those three quotes, the common theme, um, well, there is no common theme. They, everyone has their own definition of what makes someone a unicorn. And I think part of this is because um, you know, th people have this common factor where they want to tell people what they can or can't do. People want to say, oh, I don't have these skills, so you shouldn't have them either. Um, I find it hard to hire these people, so I'm going to stick my head in the sand and present, pretend these skills don't exist, make me feel better about my HR department. I don't know about you, but I'm not cool with people telling me what I'm not allowed to learn. That's a bit weird. Um, yeah. I love that GIF. Um, so job titles, if we're not unicorns, what are we? We shouldn't use words like unicorn. It just makes it, it, makes it seem ridiculous. It puts people off. You know, you wouldn't go to school and like to say you want to be a unicorn. Like, mum, I want to be a unicorn when I grow up. Don't say that. 
Let's look at some of the things that we do day to day, um, the areas of focus that we have, and the job titles people use for them. We kind of do design and code. I think that's broadly representative of the people in this room. We can break that down further and say that we do design and front end and back end, or we can break it down a little bit further and say we do user experience and information architecture and visual design, or we can break it down even further and say we do user experience information architecture and visual design, in interaction design markup style sheets, swooshy bits of gross scroll jacking uh, parallaxy JavaScript that you should never do, um, API creation, business object modeling, sysadmin, and crying yourself to sleep because you hate your boss. How far, um, how far does this go down? How far do people really need to like, break down the tiny, tiny things they do in their job, the tiny, tiny little areas of responsibility? Um, do you really need to hire someone who's really adept at visual design and crying themselves to sleep? Or can you just hire someone that's pretty good at making internet? I've, I've kind of given up like, thinking of trying to explain what I do. But I quite like just saying I kind of, I kind of make bits of internet. Um, I feel like more of an affinity to the internet than London or from the UK. So sometimes I say I'm from the internet. It kind of feels like my spiritual home. Um, I feel like more of what I do day to day is just making internet. So I say I make internet. Um, obviously, it's not a job title, but whatever. Um, it seems like job titles are getting increasingly divergent, um, but the work we do is increasingly converging. Most of the designers I know write a lot of code. Right? Most of the developers I know these days um, are pretty good designers. Designers doing sysadmin, developers are tweaking the typography. This is awesome. Um, some more job titles that you should still never use. Um, unicorn, I just don't. Um, generalist, it's a bit too general, but you know, whatever. Um, I tried saying that to someone at a really loud party once, and they were like, they thought I was a journalist um, for the whole afternoon. Um, that, I guess I just don't speak clearly enough. Um, diviner, design engineer. Imagine saying to your uncle at Christmas dinner, oh yeah, I'm a diviner. <laughs> don't say that. Why do, why do people come up with words like this? No. Um, internet maker, whatever, kind of works for me. Maybe I've just been lucky with the people I've worked with and with my heroes who I follow on Twitter, you know, observing their amazing lives and portfolios. <laughs> um, but it seems like my favorite designers are increasingly my favorite hackers, and my favorite hackers are my favorite designers. But it seems there are still some people with this kind of vested interest in making this feel weird, like it's something that you should be ashamed of, like you're a fraud for having some level of knowledge in two different areas. We've got to figure out why this is and you know, just move on from there. I say two different areas, and that's another problem in itself. It's a category error. The, the categories that we're lumping our work in are relics. They're relics of an era where design was something that happened in Photoshop and servers were written in CSS. Uh, sorry, in, not in CSS, in C++. Don't write a server in CSS. It probably won't work well. They're fault tolerant. You don't want that in a server. <laughs> so, you know, back then, back when um, programming looked a bit like this, um, it was genuinely rare for someone to have the inclination to learn both skills. You had people like some of my heroes, like Jeff Raskin um, and Alan Kay, who had a great knowledge of kind of human computer interaction, but, you know, you still wouldn't have Joseph Miller Brockman and Vim Kral um, busting out some C or COBOL. That would have been weird. So yeah, so maybe back then it was a kind of unicorny kind of skill set. Um, personally, I've got this ethos of never living my life through the lens of other people's um, thinking, especially when those people made those decisions in a totally different era. It sounds like dogma. It sounds like um, it sounds like we haven't moved on, really. And yeah, I, let's move on from there. There are these lines in the sand because people think that front end. Like front end design, front end coding is a totally different mindset to design just because you have to write some CSS rather than Sketch or Photoshop, which is really weird in itself because, like, just before the Mac and Quark, when people were like marking up design for print, 
well, that was a style sheet. You were saying Helvetica, 15 point, whatever. It's just, it's the same thing. It's so weird um, that people draw these lines in the sand, put up these barriers. The good news is that we've been bulldozing job titles for quite a while. Um, it's fine if we do it again. Um, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to put a photo of Miley Cyrus on a wrecking ball, so that will have to do for now. Um, designing things used to be pretty difficult. I don't know about you guys, but um, I studied graphic design, so I kind of know a bit about where we, where we came from as an industry. Um, it used to be really difficult to get something from a designer's mind um, onto a piece of paper or a book or something like that. In the beginning, there were scribes and book binders. You know, making a book would take years of your life, decades, I don't know, it, it took a while. Um, and then Johann Gutenberg replaced it with a printing press, and we can gloss over like 800 years of printing technology. And so, you know, we ended up um, with rooms like this, with, you know, to make a newspaper, to make a publication. You know, look at all those guys, I couldn't even count, I, loads of people, loads of people. Because um, you had to, you know, have someone to pick up the type, someone to put the type down, someone to retrieve the type, someone to ink up um, your letterpress. If you were doing photography, you'd have a photographer, an airbrusher, a developer. You know, you'd have so many people um, going into what really got replaced um, in 1985 with a Mac, a designer, a Mac, a one-to-one -one relationship between someone with an idea and someone making the idea. I guess you still had other things going on there, you still had kind of account managers and printers and stuff. Um, but you know, generally, we, um, we kept kind of bulldozing jobs. And you know, that happened on the web too. And you know what, this isn't finished. It's not like, oh, web designer, cool, we're going to be around forever. Um, we're not. I don't know if you guys saw um, Flipboard, um, the iOS kind of reading app. They recently wrote a great article about their layout algorithm. It turns out they've got this kind of generative design framework for um, rapidly creating thousands and thousands of kinds of layouts based on different variables and factors and image sizes and you know heading lengths and all of that stuff. Um, I hate to break it to you guys, but in 10, 15, 20 years, there won't be a job for people manually pushing pixels around the screen. That could be scary, or you could be like, sweet. I get to tell the machines what to do, and they get to do my work for me, and I can go to the pub early. So I'm pretty excited for that, actually. Um, but you know, like these job titles are consistently evolving. Um, those are the robots who are going to come take your jobs. That was a bit morbid. Um, what about the web? You know, we just heard about print. What about the web? It used to be really difficult to build websites. Servers would be written in C++ and Perl, and someone would cry. Um, so we split the jobs into infinitely smaller pieces, so we could actually make thing, you know, get things to work. You watch documentaries of I don't know, startups in the 90s, and they have like 3,000 people all kind of making some Oracle, C++, Java thing. Um, it's got easier. It's got easier over the past decade. It's been amazing. We've turned IT departments into the cloud, sysadmins into Git push Heroku master. The past decade has been absolutely fantastic for people looking to broaden their skill sets. Um, for, for designers, like we, we've got Ruby on Rails, which makes it really easy for us to. Um, <laughs> um, We've, we've got Ruby on Rails, which made it super easy for any designer to you know, make fully functional web applications, big social applications, versus, say, 10 years ago when you had to hack something together with WordPress and cry yourself to sleep at night. Um, the, t the technologies let us become more self-reliant. It's let us hack things together at the weekend and start companies on our own. Um, recently, we've, you know, this keeps going further. We've got tools like Meteor.js now, um, which makes Rails seem like really difficult, which is crazy because like, how, how easy can you make things get before you're like, oh my god, my job's so awesome. Things keep getting easier. I'm not complaining. Um, for developers looking to get into design, we had initiatives like Hack Design, um, an easy to follow design course for people who do amazing things. It made it really easy for developers to basically learn what I learned in three years of design school and paid like all of the student loans for, um, you know, in a couple of weeks of like really great tutorials. Um, Bootstrap, I know Stu doesn't like Bootstrap. 
Sorry, Stu. Um, but um, I love Bootstrap. Remember, like, remember what happened when back-end developers used to make things on their own without a designer or a front-end developer before Bootstrap, and everything looked like PHP MyAdmin or like Echo dollar dollar dollar. Um, Bootstrap, I think, is amazing, an amazing tool because it's let everyone get to this. You know, it's raised the the kind of baseline for someone who doesn't give a shit about design from like there to you know like there or so. Um, it's got everything looks kind of okay at least, and for people looking to get into design, um, it's fantastic because it gives them you know like a me like a medium looking thing to start tinkering with. Then they can start changing the button styles or whatever once they've got something that looks relatively decent. Making websites used to be really hard. I learned HTML and CSS a bit in the 90s. Um, I just remember like 10 years ago when I was starting to get into it properly, when I was learning graphic design, trying to figure out how to make, like, replicate the typography that we could do in print um, on the web. You had things like Cypher and Kufon. Um, remember those things? Like, those were really difficult to do um, before Flexbox, before gr good grid systems. Um, grids were really hard to do. Everything used to be really hard to do. So as much as like, I kind of wish I was there for this kind of hazy romantic era like 10, 15 years ago when everyone was like kind of indie web, um, yeah, that shit was really difficult, and it's really easy to make websites now. So you know, good job, Jeremy, and everyone else um, who kind of made things easy. Um, now HTML and CSS are so easy that everyone on your team, the non-technical team members, your accountant, your biz dev guy, your marketing people, everyone can you know, make changes to the marketing site. They do what they need to do to, um, to, you know, to deliver value for your business. This is great. It means that our companies are more likely to be successful. Um, everyone can be a designer. Everyone can be a developer. The tools are getting really easier, and I, I really like it. But yet, some people, um, some people get territorial and weird. They form these tribes um, in the office, and they give each other kind of evil looks. Um, these little dysfunctional silos that hold back progress. It's weird. Um, that is Gollum up there uh, right now represents for me. Have, has anyone got like a UX person in the office who, if ever a developer kind of goes to pick up a sharpie and a post-it note, or a developer goes to like draw a wireframe, they're like, "No, that's my job." Um, they kind of swat the sharpie out of the person's hand, and they're like, "I'm the UX person. I do the wireframes around here." Fuck that person! Like, what are they doing? Um, the front-end developer who doesn't let back-end developers write CSS, the back-end developer who passive-aggressively reverts the designer's commits to the code because you know, they're just a designer. They shouldn't be allowed to touch it. Fuck those people. Um, they do it because they feel insecure. They feel threatened that the tools that made their job once possible are getting easier and everyone has access to them. Um, I think they're actually secretly jealous that they're not unicorns or whatever better word you want to use to describe that. So we've gained a lot of baggage from the past um, that we'd like to shed off so we can ride off into the sunset of this productive bliss of internet making. But before we burn all of the history books, um, let's look through the past to see if there are any lessons we can take from it. 1919 in Weimar, Germany. Um, we've got the Bauhaus. Um, it was an early European art school. Um, it pioneered modernist graphic design and modernist photography and modernist art and modernist, basically anything with modernist in front of it. Um, it's one of my biggest influences. You know, it, you know, it kind of created the artistic and design culture that we take for granted today. A huge, huge influence. Um, whilst I was rereading a book um, about the Bauhaus's history, um, I found a quote from Walter Gropius, um, he was the founder of the Bauhaus, the first president of the Bauhaus, or however you say that in German. Um, and he said, the Bauhaus strives to combine all of the arts, sculpture, painting, applied art, and visual art as inseparable components of a new architecture. I really like this quote. 
you can cross out some of the words, you know, I don't do sculpture, I don't do painting, I definitely don't, I don't even know what applied art is, to be honest. Um, but, you know, there are some bits of it that just still kind of, you know, it really works, especially the bottom here, inseparable components of a new architecture. This idea of combining things, combining fields and disciplines that were once disparate and um, turning them into something new, into like a new, um, into a new normal. I wrote a version for the, um, for the skills that I have, design code, bit of product, um, and it still works. We strive to combine all of the arts, design code and product thinking as inseparable components of a new architecture. That's just the things that I do. You know, you can kind of fill in the blanks and write your own version, try it at home. Um, but it really comes down to this, this idea of turning what used to be many things into one thing. Who else? Who else um, in 20th century uh, mainland Europe had an inspiring story of generalism and multidisciplinary skills that we can shoehorn into an analogy? Holland, uh, 1969 to 1975-ish. Um, Ajax, not Ajax, not asynchronous JavaScript in XML, um, but actually Ajax, the Dutch football team. These guys. So. The main thing, um, the main lesson I want you to take away um, from Ajax is that long hair always makes you look cool. Um, as Christian, Jay, and Gunnar have kindly demonstrated for us this week. But wait, there's more, there is more. Um, I'm so happy with that slide. Um, from 1969 to 1974, Ajax played a style of football that were come to be known as total football. Total football relies around this idea of generalism. Um, each outfield player, anyone except the goalkeeper, um, can play in any position. The strikers could be defenders, the midfielders could be strikers, etc., etc., etc. Each player on the team is adept at defending, midfielding, and scoring goals, and if you're England, missing penalties. Um, if you can bear to say the word, I guess each player on the team was a unicorn. Let's not say that word again. Here are some diagrams showing how it works. I think you can just about see that. Um, you can kind of see that you know, people could move around. It wasn't a fixed um, thing. It was a very much a fluid combination of players. This system worked really nicely for Ajax. In 1972, they won four different European championships using it. Um, it was so successful that it was adapted by the Dutch national team. It worked pretty nicely for them as well. With this amazing system of multidisciplinary generalism, uh, they made it all the way to the 1974 World Cup final before be being beaten by West Germany. I'm English, so I know exactly what it feels like being beaten by Germany. Um, and anyway, I think we can all agree that the Germans had better hair and moustaches, so they actually deserve to win. Let's keep, let's keep going. Um, we're going to stay in Holland because Holland's really cool. Um, 1990s Amsterdam. Um, these guys. You might recognize this one. Um, just out of curiosity, does anyone recognize who this studio is? Just shout out if you know it. Sweet, no one, amazing. Um, Experimental Jet Set. They are one of my all-time favorite graphic design studios. Um, they do some really amazing work. Lots of Helvetica, um, which is really handy because I like Helvetica, so whatever. Um, Experimental Jet Set are a studio made up of three people. They've been around for 20 years, which is pretty impressive in itself. Um, but I was reading this article with them, and there was a quote that really stood out. Ooh. They said, our idea is to stay away from fixed roles. Our intention is that the workload is divided equally, and that each one of us has the same set of abilities. These guys grew up, um, I guess they, they're a product of Wim Kral and the Dutch design scene of the 70s, but also of Total Football. They grew up you know, very much as a product of the, um, the Dutch football culture that, um, that permeated Holland at the time. And so they've taken it. They've taken, um, oh, where am I going? Yeah. They've, um, they've, they've taken this idea of, um, of total football and applied it to their studio. Each of them is a generalist um, with a similar set of skills. Um, 
in different projects, they can kind of pick up the slack, you know, wherever it goes. Um, the best thing about this is that they're a traditional graphic design studio. 99% of their work is print-based. They're still amazing, but they don't do very much code. This is cool, uh, because it means that we can see what happens if we take these ideas and apply them to the work that we do. You know, what happens if you really do have a studio where that stuff applies, um, but you're doing, like, I don't know, closure and design and UX and copywriting? What if everyone could do all of that? That is really exciting. I've got to stop using that word. Um, but I, th I, th I really like these lessons from Total Football. I think it's pretty modernist as well, you know, taking your team and turning them into these kind of modular, reusable, hot swappable components, I guess, with um, consistent semantic APIs. Um, it's, it's a pretty neat idea. Um, so my takeaways from going through Europe are come up with, um, combine and come up with components that can be considered a new way of doing things, things that used to be completely disparate, things that used to be, um, you know, like totally different sides of a spectrum and, compare, and, and combine them to make a new thing. To have a team um, based on people with equal or, you know, roughly equal skill sets where everyone can kind of fill in for each other. If one person's gone to the pub early, it's okay because someone else can fill in for them. And moustaches and long hair are cool. Um, so by now, you're all like, hey, John, that sounds really awesome. I want to be a generalist internet maker, but how does that work in real life? Um, you know, how do I change my entire life so that I can have this very specific skill set that you've just described? The other day, I was on a, flight, a really, really, really long flight from America. It seemed like it lasted for like most of my life. Um, and because United don't have any in-flight entertainment, because I guess you don't pay for a movie, um, I just ended up staring at this talk for about 20 hours or something. Until that point, um, I'd kind of finished the talk. And then I, just, I realized I was wrong. I th previously thought that the lessons I'd learned from a new architecture from Total Football were that everyone should be a designer who codes. Like, everyone should have a really specific new skill set um, that design and front end and back end were the new normal. Turns out, I was just completely wrong. Um, considering any single combination of skills as the new normal is just as dogmatic a paradigm as what we're wor currently working in. If I said all designers should code, then I'm just setting up a new meme for people to follow for the foreseeable future. Um, and it's about more than that. It's, um, that's not what we want. What we want is a system that's flexible and fluid and lets people really you know, follow what they're interested in and combine new sets of skills um, to create something new. That's what stresses me out about the current model, not that they don't include X or Y, but that it just seems so rigid. It's an old model unwilling to change to evolve with the work that we're actually doing day to day. You know, telling designers to learn to code is pretty futile, actually. It, it's a really good idea if you're a designer, you should learn to code, but it's not just about that. Um, as we learned earlier, Skynet is coming, the robots are coming to take your job anyway. The, the greater theme is that uh, we just have to keep moving. We have to keep up with the uh, winds of technological change. Um, so the robots are coming for your jobs eventually. Um, everything is terrible. You're, gonna be, you're not going to be unemployed. Um, should we just go home now? No. This is exciting, not scary. The fact that things are changing so constantly and so rapidly is it's an opportunity rather than a threat. Learning is the easiest it's ever been. We've got such amazing resources for, um, for you know, kind of deciding what we want to do and then just kind of going after it. We're in this amazing position of being able to figure out what excites us and then basing a career around it. If I knew exactly what skills you could learn today to be invaluable tomorrow, I'd have written a consultancy book about it, and I'd be driving around Tuscany in a Tesla right now instead of standing on this stage. Um, I don't know. But it turns out that I don't need to tell you what you should be doing anyway. Who wants to be the best 
in the world at what they do. If you're motivated enough to come to design conferences in your spare time, then I think you're motivated enough to want to be pretty fucking good. You don't just want to be a ninja designer or whatever. You want to be Rocky Balboa, the karate kid of web design, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know. Maybe not. Um, Scott Adams, the guy who created the comic strip, um, Dilbert, said he had this great post about um, careers. He said, if you want to have an extraordinary life, um, there are two ways you can go about it. You can become the very best at one specific thing, or you can be become very good at two or more things. If you want to be a football player or a basketball player or a musician or something like that, unfortunately, you have to become the very best at one specific thing. Um, but for the rest of us, for knowledge workers, for people who generate money by sitting in front of a MacBook and like banging your head on a keyboard for a while, um, it's really easy to become very good, become indispensable by doing two or more things. Pick some things that you like to do and then you know, figure out ways of um, combining them. There's, so there's kind of no right answer. There's not like, you should definitely learn how to do closure and CSS. It's not that simple. Um, but I guess the theme is to pick things that you enjoy doing, to pick um, whatever it is that really excites you that's going to make you motivated to do the best work that you can do. Um, whatever it is that kind of makes you unique, that's what's going to make you indispensable. That's what's going to make you beat the robots in 10, 20 years. Um, figure out your own inseparable combination of skills. Um, that's how we beat the robots. Thank you. <laughs>